All right, welcome back to another episode of the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades Podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, we are going to let the legendary British writing guru, a Mr. Tim C. Taylor, introduce himself. Hello, a guru. I don't think I've ever been called a guru before, but I, I think I like it. It's my word of the day, so I figured I'd use it. <laughs> Neat. Yeah. So okay. can you tell yeah, can you tell the listeners who might not have listened to the other episodes you've been on a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I write science fiction. It's mostly space opera and military science fiction. And I've been doing that for about 10 years now. Uh, the things I'm probably best known for are the Human Legion, which of course has got spit off uh, by J.R. Handley called the Sleeping Legion. And uh, more recently, the Four Horsemen Universe and Chimera Company, published by Chris Candy Publishing. Outstanding. Uh, yes, the Human Legion is very good. You should all go check it out. It is amazing. Um, and at some point in time, you know, if the universe conspires in the right direction, he might be able to finish the audiobook series for that as well. Well, yeah, I haven't forgotten it. We're working on it. Yeah, I know. Just the universe has not been your friend lately. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so the second part of the introduction, dear listeners, how we first found them. So as I've mentioned, I'm a huge fan of his universe. Uh, and before I was writing, um, I was reading and uh, commenting on his old message board, which sadly, when he updated his website, didn't survive the, the mergers and acquisitions of the interwebs. Uh, so some of those good commentaries are just not there anymore, but it was lively back in the day. Uh, and I found him there. Uh, and so as you do, you stalk them on the interweb. Uh, when you like somebody, you show your love by stalking them um, creepily. Uh, and so I would pester him about some of the plot threads he left open to you know potentially come back to later. And finally, he had enough and he said, you just write the dang thing and the rest is history. That's and that's so how I wrote my first novel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, since this is the Blasters and Blades podcast and we have this new tradition, we cannot let you escape without the religion question. So uh, which church would you prefer to attend? Space 1999, The Last Starfighter or Wing Commander? Wing Commander. It's a good choice. I like that. No one. question. I've, I've read the novels and all of it. Yeah, it's yeah. a good one. I try to, as best I can, pick franchises that have the movie and the books. So it's a little bit of the, the merger and, you know, acquire people into the various... Um, reading properties but well, uh but yeah, i haven't actually seen the movie good. not yet but yeah. I, I enjoy it's good it, i check it out yeah i mean it's a little bit campy but well so was the the cut scenes on the the thing i i played the original thing on three and a half inch floppy disks <laughs> nice but it was amazing at the time so and because we're polytheistic we like the fantasy too never ending story jumanji because hey that's urban fantasy people so it counts or lady hawk so, so what was the first one Never ending story. Oh, Jumanji. Yeah, Jumanji's a good one. I liked Lady Hawk though because it was that whole tragic love story th angle was kind of cool the way they did it. It, it. it had that Greek tragedy air to it. Well, that is true, but there are more dice in Jumanji. This is true. There were lots yeah. of dice in Jumanji. Yep. Did you watch the remakes or I guess the, the movie two or whatever? Yeah, have they done two remakes? I saw the first of them. Well, uh, technically, they're not a remake because it's continuing on the story yeah. with new characters as opposed yeah, to actually true. just redoing it. But yeah, I, I watched uh, the first one. The second two are on my list. I think The Rock was in one of them and Chris um, Chris something, um, the actress drawing my name, the short one, um, is in it. But uh, they're on my list to watch. I've just been short waiting to watch funny. them with the kids. Yeah, short and funny. Yeah, I remember it, his it face, good. but like, the last name is, uh, is uh, escaping me. Is his last name Chris Rock? Is it? Yeah. No, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, you can tell us in the comment section. We'll leave how to contact us in the in the show notes, and you can join us on the interwebs and stalk us like we stalked Tim, and, and you can tell us uh, what we got wrong about that. But uh, so I've said this a gazillion times, but I do love short stories. Uh, when you've got a lot of time waiting at uh, for doctor's visits at the VA, sometimes it's 10-minute wait. Sometimes it's 10 hours. You just never know. So uh, I tend to start my wait with a short story that I find. Because I can finish it before they get out there, but if I start a novel, like they're going to interrupt me in the good part inevitably. Um, so it's a crapshoot, but you know they they've gotten me through many a uncomfortable waiting room experience 
Uh, so we started doing uh, interviews with authors that are writing short content because I'd like to see that become more viable for the authors so they keep doing it. Uh, today, we're going to interview Tim about his contribution to In the Wings Anthology. And if you are watching us on the YouTube, you can see that glorious cover right on your screen. So let's uh, let's see what this anthology is about. We've got 15 outstanding authors, 14 extraordinary stories, one best-selling universe. It's the 22nd century. The galaxy has opened up to humanity as a hyperactive beehive of stargates and new technologies. And we suddenly find ourselves in the vast playground of different races, environments, and cultures. There's just one catch. We're pretty much at the bottom of the food chain. Enter the Four Horsemen universe, where only a willingness to fight and die for money separates humans from the vast majority of other races. Enter a galaxy not only of mercenaries, but also of aliens, hired assassins, and accountants. Accountants? Really? Edited by best-selling author and universe creators Mark Wandry and Chris Kennedy, In the Wings brings you a variety of all-new stories in the Four Horsemen universe, showcasing characters that, until now, have always been out of step, or been one step out of the limelight. The 15 authors bring you some of the universe's minor characters, giving you additional insight into truly what makes the universe tick and some additional information you won't get anywhere else, which, as I understand, this is me, JR, speaking now. As I understand, some of the uh, short stories become pivotal points later, so yeah, they're not right. just throwaway stories. They they matter to the larger world, um, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, first off, did you write the accountant story? I have written account stories, but not in the Four Horsemen universe. Space that accounts. It's definitely yeah, a new niche. That, that, that almost sounds like a Larry Korea trope, but his name's not on the cover, and I feel like if he wrote one, it would be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, okay, so what is your story titled? So it's a Monster at the Gate. So, as you said, I mean, it, it is, this is the theme of it, really, within the Four Horsemen universe, which I think that description actually covers it pretty well. Uh, there are... I don't know. I've lost count, but there's well over 50, some of, maybe 80 odd books now altogether in the Four Horsemen universe. There's an awful lot. And uh, there are some really interesting characters in there that obviously never got a chance to really uh, come to the fore. So the call went out to, to um, look at secondary characters or minor characters and bring them into the, the limelight. And uh, the different authors have done different things. Uh, some people have taken other people's characters that are just sort of named and not do very much and then brought them right up and explored an interesting part of the universe there's some interesting ah that's why this person is called that name and why they're like this the way they are but in my case i took a character uh, and i moved the story of her beyond where we saw it in the novels uh, and hopefully that will lead to something written by another author who will take that character and run with it so uh yeah that's that's an exciting thing to do uh, and uh, the the character um, when I, I so I've written uh, four novels in a Four Horsemen universe, and they center around a a space based uh, mercenary company called uh, the Midnight Sun Free Company, and they've got a lot of aliens as well as humans, uh, and I wanted to write a uh, one of the um, as kind of a monster species called a tortantula that uh, caught my eye in the first books. Uh, so I had one and I thought, well, I'll, I'll call her Betty because that's the sort of name that uh, a truly terrifying 10 foot high monster would be called. Uh, there are actually good reasons why she's got that name. She didn't quite realize uh, that it's not necessarily the most terrifying name. Although I did know Betty, he was a bit terrifying in real life, uh, uh, but didn't look like a tortantula. Anyway, um, I wrote that character out of the novels, uh, the Midnight Sun Free Company. Uh, and the reason was I'd been talking, uh, since I wrote that uh, originally, um, uh, the series creator Mark Wandry wrote a similar character or a similar species and developed them um, quite a long way beyond where uh, I had been when I first wrote the character. So when I first wrote the, the sketch for that, my first novel, uh, there were only two Four Horsemen Universe novels. So I, I didn't have all that information. But I sort of, what I was trying to do with uh, Betty didn't quite fit in always with what Mark was wanting to do with uh, those characters. So we tried various sort of backstories and ideas and it didn't really work out. So in the end, I think Mark did a very sensible thing. Why don't you, you 
write her out uh, and then she will go on a quest. Okay, so I did that and this story is what happens next. So you see this this character uh, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take my huge monstrous character uh, and I will make her appear in her own Conan the Barbarian story. So Ooh, that was my go idea. Go on. So I, I, had, I must admit, it's a bit embarrassing. I hadn't read any Conan the Barbarian. So one of the good things about the story was I read a collection of uh, Conan the Barbarian stories, and they really are very well written. Uh, so as a recommendation, go off and buy this book in the wings and read all the, bo- read all the words inside, but then go and get a, a Conan the Barbarian collection, of which there are many that fit on a Kindle, uh, and they are excellent stories so well written and they do stand up i mean a lot of things written in the 30s you know they seem a bit clunky now but not this it really still seems fresh so whether that actually really came out in the end i'm not sure but i enjoyed reading the codan story so it wasn't a loss for me but the the setting is essentially a a, a, um, a world ruined by war uh, and there are um salvages and the life's very cheap in this situation uh, and the very salvage camps and this monster comes at the gate of this this camp the settlement it's a bit like uh, mad max i suppose uh, and that is my character so she's uh, she's there for a reason she wants something uh, uh mostly to eat people actually but she wants more than just that <laughs> as um, you do and yeah that's just her nature she just likes to eat people um so she uh, ends up having a rather uh, uh, sort of an odd couple buddy sort of quest, if you like, uh, with um, a lady called Letitia, who is a mature lady uh, with a cigar and a big gun. Uh, and they go off and they uh, there's a bit of double crossing and uh, destroying your enemies and eating them or possibly not eating everybody. And that's what they do in this story. It's a lot of, lot of fun, uh, but I like the fact that also it, uh, you know, it's it's not just a random story. It fits in, uh, and hopefully somebody else will write the story with this character, and then this will be, will link from the last occurrence to the next occurrence of of Betty the Tortangela. Okay, so other than the Midnight Sun, because that's the one you created, the the Merc Company. Do you have a favorite Merc Company in the universe? Um, yeah, I I do like Golden Horde because I actually wrote some Golden Ho- Golden Hordes. What the first four novels were the first each of the four four horsemen uh, mercenary companies, and the last one that Chris Kennedy created was uh, the Golden Horde, and uh, the the last of the the books the novels so far I've written in the Four Horsemen universe I co-wrote with Chris, so it's it's a mashup the. Midnight Sun Free Company with Golden Horde. So we each wrote each other's characters, which is quite an interesting experience. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, so I've got an attachment to the Golden Horde, definitely, after that. Okay. I, I like the uh, the Berserker one. Oh, was it Born? Bjorn? Bjorn Berserkers. Was, yeah, yeah, that they, one was good, interesting. Yeah. I was, John was born, yeah. Yeah, I like those. So other yeah. than the other than the story that you wrote, the stories that you wrote, do you have a favorite in the universe? Uh, yeah, uh, Culture's Job. Oh. Culture's Job. And I'm, I can't remember, he wrote that, which is a bit bad. And there's like a sort of main storyline, if you like, and then there's sort of spin-offs and standalones. And I think this was the first of the standalones, another very early one. Um, and it's a bit like Jason and the Argonauts, but with Mecca. Um, it it just worked really, really well. It, it very well written, very exciting. And although the you know there's some connection with the Jason story, you didn't really know it was going to go next. So that's that's one of the sort of possibly not one of the glory titles that the, that everybody would necessarily go through. But um, it uh, would be a mistake if people missed that out because I thought it was. Um, unnecessary. I mean, it's not part of the main storyline, but I think it's one of my favorites, definitely. I really liked, it was one of the early anthologies. I don't think it was even one I was in, but uh, um, 
John De La Rose wrote, and it was about like an explorer, and they sort of yeah. almost like a Mayan ruin type effect, and it was just. <laughs> It could have fit in any universe. It didn't necessarily have to be Four Horsemen, but it had that classic. The fact that it was was kind of cool because the the um, the equipment was there, the 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 tech and all that. But it had that classic sort of space opera that we yeah. grew up reading vibe it to it. I really like that one. Definitely, um, I remember. I think it was in the one that I was in for a few credits more. I think so. It was one of the early ones. Yeah. Um, but that one was that one I really really liked, and the uh, the one Brad Torgerson wrote. Um, that was a pretty oh, yeah. good one too. That I enjoyed powerful. that one. Yeah. Yeah. It was the, uh, the mech. Um, uh, well, see, I can't tell you what, it, without giving spoilers. All right. So it was really good. Look up the, uh, the Brad Torgerson, um, in the four horsemen universe. He's, he's got one of the anthologies and, and go from there. It's, it's worth reading. Definitely. So, all right. So are you going to be writing more in the four horsemen universe? Um, other than the anthologies, are you got more novels coming out? Well, I, I've, Intended to, but I think I need to have a conversation with uh, Chris Kennedy before too long. Yes, so I, I don't want to be too far away. I think it's two years between uh, The Midnight Sun, the next novel I wrote. And I don't want to be two years before the next one. It's just been, we've just, Facebook very helpfully just told me it's just been a year since the, my last Four Horsemen uh, novel. But I've been write, busy writing other novels. So, but I would like to do something perhaps next year. But I need an idea first. Fair enough. So other than the uh, the military sci-fi this universe is, do you think it fits in any other um, sub-genres of sci-fi? Well, yeah, it, it's it's uh, space adventure, I think they call it. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's also space opera, I think. It's got you know, big vistas and lots of strange things going on and deep time and so on. All right. And so because this is a military sci-fi universe, um, yep. mostly, um, as the creators have described it, so we're not putting words in their mouth, um, what is it about the subgenre of Mill SF that appeals to you? Uh, well, I think it it, uh, it gives some extremes of situations. So it can put, you know, normal people, but in extreme situations, and it can put extreme people in extreme situations. And it, it really asks questions because i think a lot of a lot of good fiction focuses on the characters uh, and the story asks questions of the characters if you're put in this situation what are you going to do and i think military science fiction is a good way of asking really hard questions of characters plus there's lots of explosions and things which can be power of the pew pew. To write. I, I dig that all right and so because we promised you a short interview about short content dear listener um we plan to deliver. So which science fiction military unit from any franchise out in there in the ethos would you want to serve with? Ah, now you'll be surprised at this. It's the seventh cavalry. So I'm reading a a series called the last brigade by Bill Webb. Have you come across that? I have. We've interviewed him. He's a, he's a good guy. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, been writing something somewhere else with with Bill or working with him. Uh, So I I looked into this series that was, was, you know, his his big series and uh, I'm hooked. So I'm on book four now. I only started last week. So, yeah, I mean, that's definitely science fiction. It's, you know, a post-apocalyptic idea, but, uh, well, I won't give away the, you know, the idea behind it, but uh, yeah, I'm absolutely hooked on that. And that's the thing I'm, 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 uh, that I'm reading at the moment. So, Seventh Cavalry, that's my lot. Okay, fair enough. Uh, does that for you? Is it like it is with me? It changes to whatever you're reading at the time. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, if you're really engaged, that's the thing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm in this universe, and I know it's not real, really, but uh, partly doesn't want to believe that. So I'm, I'm there. So that's that's definitely it changes right. what I'm reading. So this is a two part question for you. Of all the military sci-fi tech that you read about, which one do you want for daily use? I, I think the uh, uh, jump gates, warp drive, whatever it is, instantaneous or near instantaneous travel. Uh, so the FTL. Yeah, yeah, the FTL stuff. Uh, I, I think is so fascinating in so many ways. You just go and explore the universe uh, and see so many things you can't ever see except through a telescope 
And from the point of view of military science fiction, uh, it depends on obviously how the setup of your universe works, but it can make a completely different view of, of how to conduct a military operation. I mean, if you can appear anywhere in the universe, for example, through a system of gates, then there's no such thing as a front line, for example. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's fascinating, a little bit scary, because who can come through the gate? But, yeah, I think that's what I'd like. All right, now we're going to narrow down, since this is a Four Horsemen Universe story uh, and a Four Horsemen Universe anthology, what of all the the technology that's available in the 4HU do you want for daily use? Hmm. I think, although I'm not sure my wife would agree, but I'd like the pin plants uh, that uh, enhance your brain, allow you to do multiple things at the same time, uh, probably allow you to get uh, uh, satellite TV and everything as well um, while you're at it. I think the enhancements to the brain, particularly after a few decades of existence where the brain doesn't work quite as sharply as it used to, uh, I think that would be uh, an exciting upgrade and an opening of new possibilities. I thought you were going to go for the Casper. Oh, well, there'd be lots of those. But I see I can control them remotely. We've got the right pin plants. <laughs> All right. Now that you have the pin plants, how do you abuse it? Because come on, like if I had a lightsaber, totally using it for inappropriate purposes. Yeah. The hey, y'all watch this is real. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to tell you, but uh, it would be illegal. So I don't want to give away my my, my secrets. <laughs> what I All right, intend to do. Enough. Because the future right. is a bonus. It will be here. This is true. Elon Musk had that pig uh, <laughs> control of implants. So, yeah. all right. So uh, as we wrap this up, Tim, can you tell listeners how they can find you? And as usual, dear listener, it will be in the show notes. Yep. The uh, best way to find me is to go to humanlegion.com. All right. And he'll, his other links will be involved, included as well. And you can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades. Anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades. You can follow us on Twitter at SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email us at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. You can join the shenanigans over on our Facebook group, which is facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. You can support the show at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section that it is for the podcast, and I will make sure we keep my co-hosts duly intoxicated until they will drink until their liver surrenders. Uh, and if Seska was here, she would say, never quit, never surrender. Um, so, And you can also support us on uh, Anchor FM. They have a reoccurring subscription option if you choose to use that route. Um, so thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For the absentee Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. And that's it.